For the first time in 30 years, the United States is building nuclear weapons. And not just missiles and bombs, but new submarines, new airplanes, and new underground silos to launch them. Over the next three decades, the US military will spend an estimated $2 trillion replacing nearly every piece of its Cold War arsenal. The original Manhattan Project, for comparison, cost just $30 billion, and that's adjusted for inflation. In other words, the American public is about to spend the equivalent of another Manhattan Project every five months for the next 30 years. Why? Sponsored by Brilliant. Learn math, science, and computer science the intuitive way with a link in the description. By the end of the Cold War, the US and Soviet Union had accumulated over 60,000 nuclear weapons. But as the USSR collapsed, their numbers began to fall, down to just 11,000 in 2009. That year, newly elected President Barack Obama called for a world without them, for which he won the Nobel Peace Prize. A year later, the US and Russia signed New START, an arms control treaty that limited the number of warheads each country could actively deploy. In the eyes of many, nuclear weapons were fast becoming obsolete. And that, for most people, is where they've remained. But the truth is, they've been quietly making a comeback. To ratify that treaty with Russia, Obama made a compromise with Republican senators to set aside billions of dollars to modernize America's arsenal. And once that door was opened, it became impossible to close. Billions became trillions. Initially, the argument was that many of our weapons had been built 30, 40, or even 50 years earlier, and thus were in need of a tune-up. Take plutonium pits, for instance. Inside every nuclear weapon is a compressed sphere of plutonium about the size of a bowling ball that initiates the explosion. We know that plutonium degrades over time. We just don't know exactly how much time. In 2007, an independent group of scientists estimated a lifespan of at least 100 years. And in 2012, another group artificially aged some plutonium by 150 years, after which they found no unexpected defects. Nevertheless, we're now in the process of producing about 80 new pits a year at a cost of about 18 to 24 billion dollars. And that's just the beginning. As the name implies, America's nuclear triad has three components, an air, sea, and land leg. And we're replacing all of them at the same time. First, the US Air Force operates three nuclear bomber bases in North Dakota, Louisiana, and Missouri. Together, they house a fleet of 66 nuclear-capable planes, 20 B-2As, and 46 B-52H bombers. The former are set to be completely replaced by a new B-21 model, and the latter will get redesigned engines. Next, the US Navy maintains a fleet of 14 ballistic missile submarines, 8 in the Pacific, stationed in Washington, and six in the Atlantic, stationed in Georgia. These Ohio-class ships will soon be replaced with new Columbia-class boats, at a cost of at least $112 billion. And finally, all across Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska are 450 of these unassuming fenced-off areas. Underneath them lie silos, and in these silos sit intercontinental ballistic missiles. The ones we have now are called Minuteman missiles, because they can strike anywhere on the planet in less than 30 minutes. Well, apparently that's not good enough. The Air Force is now replacing all of them. It's also upgrading the silos, command centers, and the 7,500 miles of underground cables that connect them. The question is, do we need all this? There's an argument to be made that given what's at stake, we should restart production of plutonium pits. This would show the world that after a 30-year break, we can still make them. 
and it would give us a backup plan just in case our existing ones degrade faster than expected. But it's much harder to see why we need 80 of them a year. That seems like an excessive and excessively expensive amount of redundancy. And the same can be said about nearly all these upgrades. At any given moment, on any given day, the United States has 1,700 nuclear warheads deployed across dozens of submarines submerged hundreds of feet underwater, hundreds of missile silos waiting to launch at a moment's notice, and dozens of bombers capable of flying undetected up to 50,000 feet in the air. Any one of these warheads could destroy a mid-sized city, and each submarine and bomber carries several. This more than guarantees our ability to retaliate should one of our adversaries attack first. In other words, it's hard to see what the 1700th and first weapon does that the 1700th can't. Now, it would be one thing if this were merely wasteful. And make no mistake, it is. All of these projects are behind schedule and over budget. The new ICBMs alone have already grown to an estimated cost of $141 billion, an 81% increase from 2020. And get this, the budget for plutonium pits more than tripled between 2017 and 23, half a billion dollars of which is due to a roof that was designed 13 feet lower than it should have been. But these upgrades aren't just wasteful. They're also dangerous. Take the land leg of the Triad, for instance. Originally, these stationary missiles were justified for their survivability. Surely, the Soviet Union couldn't find and target them all, and thus we'd always be able to retaliate. But today, technology has improved enough that our submarines, to say nothing of our stealth bombers, serve the same purpose. And they do it better and more cost-effectively. One submarine hidden deep underneath the ocean is a lot harder to find and destroy than 400 missile silos that are plainly visible from Google Earth. Along the way, the justification for keeping these missiles has shifted from survivability to using them as a kind of nuclear sponge. If another country were to attack the United States, the thinking goes, They'd first have to waste something like 400 weapons of their own just to stop us from retaliating. Needless to say, this isn't a very comforting possibility, given that even if it worked as intended, it would still kill millions of Americans. Either you believe that the other two legs of our triad already guarantee our ability to retaliate, in which case our ICBMs are a gigantic waste of money, or you believe they're useful, in which case they act as a target drawing nuclear attacks into our country's interior. And whatever value that has is offset by the risk of an accidental launch. A submarine or bomber can turn around at any time, but a missile, once launched, cannot. In the heat of the Cold War, we cared about speed above all else. Given the heightened risk at the time, every second was of paramount importance. Today, that speed is less of an asset and more of a liability. Now, the odds of an accidental launch are terrifying but exceedingly small. But while these new missiles and submarines and bombers themselves aren't likely to cause World War III, the far bigger danger is that our adversary's reaction to them does. Unlike your typical bridge to nowhere, wasteful yet harmless, this boondoggle provokes a response. This $2 trillion project was originally sold as a mere renovation, to restore deterrence and maintain the nuclear equilibrium. But as its scale and scope has expanded, our adversaries are less and less likely to see it that way. And deterrence has always been about perception. Thus, we may be stuck with the worst of both worlds. That all these new weapons do nothing to enhance our security, but that Russia and China and North Korea's response to them degrades it. If nothing else, this is a signal, a $2 trillion signal to the world, that we don't expect nuclear weapons to fade into irrelevance. It would be crazy if Moscow and Beijing and Pyongyang weren't paying attention. Indeed, we know they are. 
since we started upgrading our arsenal, all of our adversaries have doubled down on nuclear weapons. Russia, most notoriously, has made threats of nuclear blackmail during its war with Ukraine, even going so far as to transfer some of its nukes to Belarus. It started to develop new types of weapons, and it completely backed out of New START, meaning it will soon be able to deploy as many nuclear weapons as it wants when the treaty expires in 2026. And while China's stockpile remains only a fraction as large as Russia's or America's, it's begun growing rapidly in recent years. Now, individually, Moscow and Beijing and Washington can argue, and may genuinely believe, that they're simply reacting, that their new and upgraded weapons are merely aimed at restoring deterrence in the face of rising threats. But collectively, we have a name for when everyone is simultaneously restoring deterrence. It's called an arms race. The risk of nuclear war is at its highest point since the end of the Cold War. But it's not all bad news. So is interest in nuclear energy, for example. And Brilliant, today's sponsor, can teach you the basics of fusion and fission so you can better prepare for this new, more uncertain world. Brilliant has courses on everything from quantum mechanics to programming, probability, and logic. They believe, as I do, that how you learn matters just as much as what you learn. We learn more effectively when we're actively engaged in solving a puzzle or problem than when new words and facts are just thrown at us to memorize. Brilliant uses this principle to build engaging, interactive, and fun step-by-step -step lessons with real projects and challenges that teach you how to analyze, think through, and solve a problem. Like how to use what you've learned to calculate the value of an electric car, or build a recommendation algorithm for Spotify. To check out Brilliant completely free for 30 days, click the link on screen now or in the description below. That's brilliant.org slash polymatter. Doing so will also get you 20% off an annual premium subscription. Go pick what interests you most and start learning today.